Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good to see you. We will be starting in about one minute. We have uh, quite a quite a few registrants for today, and uh, we'd like to give everybody an opportunity to be able to join us. So we'll be starting in about one minute. Welcome everyone, thank you, thank you. We'll be starting shortly, just a few more seconds. Good to see everyone. Great. Hi, my name is Brian McDonald. I am Director of Client Relations for ANJA Education Consultants, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar today where for the next 20 minutes, we will be sharing our key insights and best tactics for college admissions, then we're going to quickly give you a couple of options if you'd like to meet with us privately to discuss how we might help your individual situation. And then the balance of the time is for your questions. Okay, so I'd like to introduce the president of Anja Education Consultants, Anjali Mazel. Anjali is a former Princeton University interviewer, TED Talk speaker, and college admissions expert. She's also the proud mom of a thriving 26-year-old now in grad school. Anjali has helped hundreds of students get into their top perfect match schools, including Yale and Stanford, John Hopkins and Vanderbilt, Swarthmore and UT Austin, just to name a few. So, okay, thanks again for being here today and it's over to you, Anjali. Thanks so much, Brian. Hi, everybody. I am so glad to be with you today. And I know that a lot of you are here because you can clearly see that applying to college has become much more challenging. And I bet many of you are feeling a mixture of excitement and anxiety. So first, I want to just let you know that I truly understand these feelings. And as a parent and as a professional, I have been where you are. By the end of this talk today, after I outline the specific challenges and solutions, I think you're going to feel much more clear and in control of the process. Not only that, but probably more confident and more aligned with what you truly want. So I'd like to start by telling you a brief story. I grew up in New York City and I went to an extremely competitive high school. And just to give you an idea, I had about five or six hours of homework almost every day, and I really felt oppressed by it all. I did well despite this, but I was truly ready to get out of there and go to college. And my senior year in high school was extremely bizarre. Uh, my classmates and their parents, they got together and they offered me cash to withdraw my applications after I was admitted early action to Yale. And apart from that really unsettling feeling that that offer that they made gave me, I had not decided if I wanted to go to that school. I wanted to wait for the spring. I wanted to wait to see what other options would open up for me. And in the end, as it turned out, I did not end up going to Yale, but I went to Princeton instead. But you know, this experience really left me feeling uncomfortable. So when planning my own son's education, I was determined that he would not suffer that kind of crushing, toxic academic atmosphere that I had endured. And which in the end, you know, I felt like it really had been unnecessary to get me where I needed to go. So I, you know, I wanted my son to be happy first and foremost. Um, but I also, of course, as a parent, wanted him to be successful and how to strike the right balance. So the difficulty really started in choosing a high school for him. We kind of went back and forth between highly competitive, well-known prep schools and a small unknown school that prioritized love of learning. And I realized that either way, there would be trade-offs. And in the end, though, I chose the small school where my son ended up finding his passion. So, you know, given that I had been an interviewer for Princeton for many years and, and a teacher, 
who wrote a lot of letters of recommendation and gave college essay guidance. You'd think that the process of guiding my son through the college admissions process would be easy, right? Not at all. So I ended up finding a colleague for him to work with. And after uh, many months, he was admitted into an Ivy League school, but that's not what he chose. He made what some might think was a very unexpected decision. And I'll tell you about it at the end of the webinar. So what I want you to know at this point though, is that I have been where you are. And although I knew the system well, when my son applied to college, as a parent, I had complicated feelings. I was vulnerable to frustration and fear and even some confusion at times, but I did learn something important. I discovered that my son, like all of you here today, was facing a threefold problem when applying to college. And number one is increased competition. Number two, complexity of the application process. And number three, the rising cost of college. So what does this challenge look like in practice? Let's look at the competitiveness first. So if you were a Texas student, for example, in the 90s and graduated in the top 20% of your class, you were automatically admitted to the University of Texas at Austin. Today, you'll need to graduate in the top 6% of your class. If you were applying to Yale in the 90s, you had an 18% chance of admission. Now it's under 5%. 70% of USC applicants were admitted in the 90s, but in 2022, it was under 12%. So maybe some of you read a Wall Street Journal article recently about a young woman who had an SAT score of 1550, a GPA of 3.95, phenomenal extracurricular and leadership experiences who applied to top tier schools and was admitted to none of them. So, you know, there's no doubt that college admissions is super competitive. Now let's look at the complexity of the application process, the second C. So 20 years ago, you might've applied to one or two colleges. The process was clear and straightforward. And um, today, now, because of all the many moving parts of the applications, students are applying to many more colleges, as many as 8 to 15 for our students. So there is a lot to stay on top of, and the complexity is increasing. As you have probably heard, ChatGPT and other generative AI are already impacting and will continue to impact how colleges view essays. Admission staff are looking for new ways to make sure that a student is who they say they are in their writing. Additionally, in the face of recent Supreme Court decision about affirmative action, colleges are going to have to dig deeper to understand what each student brings to the college community. To give you a glimpse into the complexity, take a look at all the elements that should be in place optimally, right, that to for a student to have the best merit scholarship and admission results. That's a lot to stay on top of. And recently, a friend of mine was telling me about the ordeal of helping him, his son apply to college. Uh, last fall, the numbers of different essays, the completely different online applications to fill in, the SAT prep, coordinating with his school for the letters of recommendation, and the transcript, different deadlines, coordinating summer internships, et cetera, et cetera, right? And all of this was a ton of work and created a lot of tension between this friend of mine and his son. So clearly this complexity needs to be simplified. After the complexity and the competitiveness, we've seen the first two Cs. The fact is that the college has gotten incredibly expensive. If you'll just look at this graph and brace yourself, uh, this really illustrates how the cost of college has exploded. The red line here on the bottom is the rate of inflation. And as you can see, the black line is the rate of increase in college tuition. Clearly college tuition has massively outpaced inflation for decades now. 
Private colleges can, co can cost upwards of 77,000 a year, while in-state tuition for public schools can even cost beyond 28,000 per year. So there is, in all of this difficulty, there is really good news. Merit scholarships can be worth tens of thousands and even hundreds of thousands of dollars. So how do you obtain those merit scholarships? We want to share with you three quick stories that illustrate how we guide students to gain a competitive edge, simplify the complexity, and maximize scholarships to reduce the cost of college. So let's start with Tony. When we began working together in 10th grade, Tony had high A's and an SAT score in the 1500s. He was stellar in math, so his teachers and family were naturally pushing him toward engineering. But after talking with Tony, he made it really clear that engineering was not what he wanted. However, and this was the game changer, we discovered he had a significant talent and passion in art as well as STEM. So we matched him with a local art mentor and a summer program to develop his portfolio, the portfolio that he could then include with his application. Exploring his interests in visual arts and combining this with his talent in math led Tony to discover a passion for architecture. And this discovery made all the difference because it really made Tony stand out. Why? Because now Tony had a story to tell. Nothing will make you stand out from the crowd more than having your own story that gem demonstrates genuine interest and passion and growth. So to summarize, Tony discovered his passion. We simplified the application process by guiding him to find a clear major and career path he loved, architecture. Tony secured a $100,000 scholarship to Tulane, and by curating his art portfolio and targeting his essays to align with architecture and his new vision for himself, Tony found a competitive edge. So what was the result? He was admitted to his first choice, Rice, so he ended up not going to Tulane after all. He went to Rice because it was also his early decision, and now he's finished a couple of, of successful years there. Now, in this way, Tony solved the threefold problem of college admissions. But not all of us are straight-A students like Tony. Many of us get A's and B's. We might have a down year, get sick, or go to a very competitive high school, but we're still ambitious. This was Ellen. Ellen had a B average, and she was in a very competitive high school, but was confident about thriving in a very selective college. We discovered that her GPA had significantly increased over the three years of high school through her hard work. When she got B's, she didn't get discouraged. She, it motivated her to get tutoring and find a college professor as a mentor. And she kept signing up for challenging classes. She also rose to a leadership position in yearbook and got a summer internship in a startup incubator to explore a major in business. But how was she going to pull all these threads together to showcase her accomplishments? Ellen worked to tell her story in a compelling way. We helped her tell her story as a journey of growth and responsibility. She demonstrated through her essays and applications how she learned from setbacks and how these setbacks led to her development and improvement. In fact, they became assets. So maybe you or your child are like Ellen. You discovered a specific passion halfway through high school. Maybe you began to excel by the end of junior year. Or maybe you are a straight-A student who had a clear major in mind from the start. Either way, you may not recognize what is exceptional about you. And everyone, we've seen this to be true, everyone has a powerful story to tell. You need to find that story and to tell your story in a memorable way, your passions, your challenges, and your successes. So to summarize, for Ellen, she simplified the application process by keeping accountable and breaking down the long list of tasks into small steps. She, sub sub she ended up submitting standout applications and she eventually received 12 scholarship offers ranging from $20,000 to $100,000. 
She gained a competitive edge by pulling all her academic and extracurricular experiences together into a compelling story in the essays and interviews. So despite her GPA, she was admitted as a business major to Emory University, her first choice. Very competitive major at a very competitive college. So Ellen solved the threefold problem of college admissions. Now for our, th third, our third case study, Grace, her story is a little different. She had an AB GPA, no test scores, had a remarkable singing talent she needed to showcase. So what was the solution to the threefold problem of admissions for Grace? First, simplify the process by keeping her organized and on task through spreadsheets and an application tracking system. Second, keeping costs down by optimizing all aspects of the applications and tailoring the college list in Grace's case. She was awarded scholarships ranging from eighty dollars to $199,000. Third, as Grace was a singer, she gained a competitive edge by curating her vocal submissions, her records, her, her reels, and keeping her to the, to the plan of applying to very selective music programs, the key was attending the selective Grammy camp one summer. In the end, she was accepted to her first choice college, the very prestigious California Institute of the Arts, also known as CalArts. So the three students we discussed, Tony, Ellen, and Grace, were all success stories, but they were all very different. Yet for all these students, they solved the problem of competitiveness, complexity, and cost of college. Through these case studies, we hope that you have gotten some valuable tips on what to prioritize in college planning. But bef And before we answer your questions, which is going to be the main part of today, is going to be for you to ask your specific questions. Before we do that, let's first answer the most common question we get, which is, how can you work with us? Before we give you the three simple options, here's our track record. So for our 2023 application cycle, our students received over $5 million in scholarships and our average four-year scholarships per student, if you added all their four-year scholarships together, on average, our students received $237,000 worth of scholarships. The return on investment for our families, given this, was very high, and our fees, as usual, were paid for many times over. Now, the students we worked with uh, not only had those great results with scholarships, but also with acceptances, and they were admitted to some of the most selective colleges in the country, including Stanford, University of Pennsylvania, Dartmouth, Johns Hopkins, and also fantastic schools like UC Riverside, Penn State, Ohio State, and Texas A&M. And best of all, these colleges were the right fit for each applicant. So if you want to gain a competitive edge, simplify the application process and keep costs down like the hundreds of students we've helped ace college admissions. Here are the three simple options. So option number one is for eighth to 10th grade students. And with a one-year early talent development packages, we have time to identify your kids' talents early, discover their passions, and make sure they really stay on track. This option also maximizes admissions and scholarship results when they apply to college later on. We will help optimize their GPA, their test scores, extracurriculars, and summer planning. And the packages start at $29.97. Option number two is for 11th to 12th grade students. And our two-year application package, or one year if you're starting with us as 12th graders, it's absolutely the same. Uh, this is our most popular one, and it'll give you a competitive edge. It'll simplify the complex application process, keep costs low. You'll work directly with me in this case, and we will help optimize essays, SAT prep and testing in collaboration with Method Learning, our partner, and uh, summer planning, as well as demonstrated interest for each college. 
And this package working directly with me is 19,997. There is a third option and that's for 11th to 12th graders as well. And this two year package or one year, if you're starting with us as a 12th grader, it's exactly the same as the A-list package that we just talked about. The only difference is that instead of working with me, you will be working with one of the advisors that I have handpicked and trained. And the cost for that is 7997 So if you're serious about working with us, please sign up for our free discovery session and bring your questions. Students, please have both parents with you. So sign up for when they're available and parents, please bring your spouse if possible. So Sydney, our wonderful moderator is now gonna drop the sign up link for that discovery session in the chat right now. And please, again, this session is to uh, explore our packages and answer your questions. Students, please bring your parents. So sign up for when they can attend. Parents, please bring your spouse if possible. Now, before I answer your questions, I want to finish the story about my son who applied to college a few years ago. At the end of this process, he, as I mentioned, uh, did in fact get into uh, this Ivy League school, but that's not what he chose. Instead, after a lot of research, investigation, deep reflection, and a visit to campus, my son chose an amazing school, Carleton College in Minnesota, which you may or may not have heard of, but it turns out employers, graduate schools, and prestigious fellowship boards know very well. It was by far a better choice for him than the Ivy. At Carleton, my son got more attention, classes were more targeted, his professors advocated for him. He stood out. And after his freshman year, he was awarded the Orion Mission Internship at NASA and a second Orion Mission Internship at NASA the following summer. Today, he's in graduate school at an Ivy League college and tells me that in retrospect, this was absolutely the right decision for him. And best of all for me as a mom, he's happy and thriving. So parents and students, I know you may be anxious right now, but I can assure you that there are many different paths to success. Please remember, college is not a destination. The college application process can help you begin to discover a sense of purpose, what really matters to you in your life. It's a great first step in designing a life of meaning and financial stability where you are going to be happy about the career you chose and make decisions that bring you fulfillment. So that's really what I wish for all of you. Now. Uh, let's see what questions you're asking. Um, by the way, please do sign up for that free discovery session. Um, Sydney, could you please post that link again in the chat? Uh, if you are serious about working with us, students, please come and meet with us, bring your parents. So sign up for a time they can attend and parents, please bring your spouse. Okay, and I also am going to leave the uh, share the screen again and uh, share uh, this information. Okay, wonderful. So Q and A. Let's get started. Yes. Any myths about Princeton? That's very uh, very interesting question. You know, the reason we called this uh, this webinar "Myths and Understanding the System" is that. There are a lot of misconceptions about what, first of all, what it takes to get into a super selective school. Um, students and families and parents are always looking for some kind of formula, right? What's the formula for, for doing that? Well, there isn't a formula. Um, many of the students who are now being admitted to the schools that are considered the top ranked schools. They certainly have a number in US News and World Report. Um, they're looking for students who have national 
international recognition and some kind of awards. Um, but it can also be students who have made a real difference in their community, uh, who have um, been incredibly supportive in their own family, who have taken care of um, family members. There, there's a wide variety of, of uh, reasons why students have that edge to get into these super competitive schools. But I would say that the biggest myth is, and mind you, I'm very grateful for my Princeton education. Don't get me wrong, right? Uh, absolutely, I'm grateful for it. But I do not believe anymore because I have helped many students through this process. I do not believe that the Ivies or the quote unquote top ranked colleges have a monopoly on good, solid education and career possibilities for students. Studies have shown that the best predictors of success for most students, unless you're a first gen student, first generation college student, then rank can actually help. But for most students, what matters is not the rank of the college long term, but it is what you do when you get to the college. Is it a good fit for you? Is it a place where you're going to be able to work in depth with a professor? Are you going to be able to contribute to the college community through student organizations? By working closely with professor who you're mentored with, doing independent projects like research when you get to college, and when you get to college, contributing to the college community by getting really involved and connected to the student body through organizations and initiatives that are already there or that maybe you add to the group, these foster a sense of belonging. And the sense of belonging has been linked to higher GPAs in college. And the higher GPAs in college are linked to better outcomes like better grad schools, better jobs, better summer internships. So this is a big myth. Rather than, you know, we, yes, there is competitiveness, but there are also some incredible colleges out there that really want to hear your story, right? Where you are at the top of the applicant pool right, where um, there are many, many advantages to being at the top of the applicant pool, including the fact that that transition to college is going to be easier. So your first year, you'll already be doing well, and you'll maybe be able to integrate already into that community and begin to have leadership positions in college. So there are many different advantages, right, to being at the top of that applicant pool. So this is a kind of big secret in this, in this world of college admissions. Start to get to know your likely and target schools. Don't just focus on your reach and what we call lottery schools. The reason we call them lottery schools is because the chances of admission are incredibly low, even if you have submitted optimal applications. So of course your job, is to identify those colleges that are the best fit for you. What does that mean? That means places where you're going to thrive, where you're going to excel, where you're going to be happy. You're going to find your tribe. You're going to, um, it's going, you know, the school and the program and the networking uh, opportunities and the community are going to help you get, get where you want to go and have fun while, while you're doing it, right? So um, myth, you know, myths about Princeton, I think it's really more myths about um, what, what, it, what is a good college. Um, if you rely exclusively on the U.S. News and World Report rankings, or any rankings for that matter, there are a bunch of different rankings. Each ranking system has a series of uh, flaws, right? And if you take that because that's an easy way, right? It's so easy to just look at a number and say, oh, that must be better. Well, if you look at the trend recently, a lot of medical schools, you know, top ranked medical schools, um, including Harvard, have been pulling out of U.S. News because there's some problems, right? Now, nothing wrong with new U.S. News. Again, each ranking system has its advantages and disadvantages. What we're trying to say is be very mindful of how you put together your college list. 
Don't look down on colleges that have a higher admission rate. Look at their honors programs, okay? If you're very high achieving, um, and, and also some of these colleges uh, that have the higher admission rates, that have honors programs, they might be a great fit and they might give you really significant merit scholarships. So, you know, what we're trying to say is truly dive into exactly what kind of environment is going to be best for you. What kind of place will allow you to thrive? What do you need? The more you know about yourself, first of all, the more you're going to be able to write those essays that help you shine, right? Help the true you shine through. Uh, when we work with students, we have interest and strengths assessments that are really helpful for that. Um, to start to get to know what your strengths are. And then find the colleges that will allow you to build on those strengths. Maybe colleges that will help you bridge any gaps that you have in your education um, and, and that will provide environment. So the kind of environment that is most beneficial for you. There are many different resources uh, to put a college list together. When students work with us, we have our own proprietary combination. Um, but uh, if you are doing it on your own, you can start with College Navigator, which is a government website. It's, you know, the for the first level of uh, decisions about which colleges to keep and which to take out, it's quite good. Um, and then there are others, which we can talk about at another time, because I really do want to give other, other questions a, a chance. But the reason I spent so much time on this one is that, uh, you know, if you can remember what the goal of college is and look, see through those myths, you know, if I, the myths include, if I don't get into X college, my life will be ruined. Uh, you know, if I, um, if I am not, uh, you know, if, if, you know, if, if I don't major in um, business engineering, or, you know, um, computer science, uh, I'm going to be poor. Uh, you know, th there are a lot of myths out there. So the more you can do the research um, about the schools, about what they have to offer, and get to know yourself, the better that fit is going to be. And that can make a huge difference for you. Okay. Um, yes. Will you be giving more details on the chat GPT comment? First, I've heard of this relative to college admissions. Yeah. So um, chat GPT and other generative AI, um, you know, different uh, universities and high schools have noticed that students sometimes are using these tools, they are tools, uh, AI tools uh, to help write those essays. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of controversy about that right now. This, the, the overall, we don't know exactly how things are going to evolve, but what we do know is that because of this, colleges are really going to be looking with a microscope to try to really understand who the student is. This is one of the reasons why we're developing new uh, approaches to help tell that story in a way that absolutely um, can confirm to the colleges, you know, so that they understand. Because this is, you know, these, these changes, it's really important to stay current with the way the college admissions landscape is working. Uh, it evolves. And um, the more you can stay on top of it, the better. Uh, obviously, if you know, if you if you work with somebody like like me, then I'm the one that keeps up with all of this stuff. Uh, if you're doing it on your own, that's fine. Just keep try to keep current with what's going on. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, there are uh, what I'm telling what we're telling our students is follow the guidelines of your high school follow the guidelines of the colleges you're applying to. Um, you know, plagiarism is, is, not, is not okay. Uh, we, you know, you need those essays to be your own work. Uh, down the line, 
we will learn how to use these tools and, and educational institutions will probably learn how to use these tools in a way that's beneficial to students. For now, just follow those uh, high school and college guidelines. Okay, how can we connect multiple interests to a central passion? Yeah, you know, there are many creative ways. This is a good question. Many creative ways of discovering the thread that links together your varied interests. One way to do this, for example, let me give you kind of a, you know, somewhat uh, an example that I think some of you will relate to. Let's say that you have a strong interest in business and you have an interest in medicine. Um, and you are very good with people and you're quite, um, you know, you're quite extroverted. Uh, we've, we had a student uh, last year who brought his interest in business and in his case, it wasn't medicine, it was music together. And he did fundraising through concerts because he was very good with uh, music. But, you know, you could end up doing a, you know, research project that would have business implications. So what you want to try to do, what I'm, what I'm saying is there are projects, personal projects that you can do that could be wonderful ways to tie in your different interests. Um, these can be research or it can be entrepreneurial or it can be proposing volunteer initiatives in your community, whether it's your school community or it's your uh, actual uh, you know, city or um, if it's an online community. There are so many ways of weaving these interests together. Um, now, if you have interests that you have been unable to weave together, that's okay too. You know, there is, there are undecided majors uh, in most colleges where you, it's either called undecided or you can say you exploratory. They're a different kind of, they call them different things in different colleges. But, you know, it's fine to, to just say I'm interested in, you know, math and um, sociology and uh, jazz music. And, you know, I may want a double major and minor. I'm not sure. You know, as long as you show which what each interest, what you have done in each area to further your technical abilities, to further your um, uh, the impact of what you do, anytime you can use your talents to have impact on the community, whichever of those communities, uh, it's great because that allows you to have a real world experience, but also be working in an area that you're passionate about. And the combination of impact and passion can be wonderful when you're applying to college to optimize admission results and scholarships. Okay. And Yes, what if your senior has no idea what they like to major in? Okay, no problem. Just what I just said about being undecided. Perfectly okay. Just talk about the interest in the different fields. All right. And yes, so how early should you start preparing for college? Yeah. So really, um, you can, it's not about, um, you know, grooming students from sixth grade. You know, we don't want to turn students into uh, what a former Yale professor William DeRezowitz calls excellent sheep. We don't want to turn them into like little soulless robots that are just programmed to, you know, prepare for college. That's not the goal. The goal is um, to expose, to um, help students discover, to expose them to a variety of opportunities, early even, that will allow them to start to understand what really matters to me. What do I love doing? What am I really good at? Any kind of real world experiences, whether it's going away to a camp, sometimes it's not, it has nothing to do with the field, but it can be character building. We've had students who've been camp counselors, We've had students who are computer scientists who loved Shakespeare and who went and did 
five years when they were in high school uh, and beginning of end of middle school of um, summer camp doing a Shakespeare play each year. Um, you know, we've had, we've seen how um, it's really possible to um, learn about the world and slowly discover those talents, develop those talents so that you're able to demonstrate those talents at the very end of the process and maximize your admission and scholarship results. Okay, so what is the benefit, in my opinion, of attending an Ivy League school for four years over a community college for two years and transferring to an Ivy League? Well, of course, we can't know uh, you know, you can't like say, okay, I'm going to go to a community college and then I'm going to go and get, you know, apply to an Ivy and be able to transfer. It's like, you know, you may, that may, that may not be the way it unfolds. Um, community college can be a great option. Uh, if you are trying to save money, if, you know, if you understand what the community college experience is like, if, and if you're okay with that, it really depends on your situation. Um, sometimes if a student hasn't done that well in high school, but they're ambitious, if you're that's your situation, uh, and you think you can do a lot better than what you did in high school, you can do a community college for two years. First of all, you save money. Second of all, you can show colleges what you're capable of. The only thing is this, be very careful. Colleges don't always accept the credits from a two-year college, like a community college. Be very sure which agreements your local community college has and which colleges they have agreements with. They may only have agreements with colleges in your state, for example. Colleges that uh, you know will recognize the credits from that specific community college. So find out, right? If you're planning a strategy like that, really find out. Um, so yeah, there are all sorts of reasons why students attend community college, and it can be a great solution. The thing is, though, uh, be realistic in your expectations in the sense that if you know which colleges are going to accept those credits, then you're going to be able to plan ahead. Um, if you don't care, you know, if the college accepts the credits or not, and you you say, okay, well, I'll do two years, but then you know, it's just to show the super competitive colleges what I'm capable of. And I'll do another four years there. If you're okay with doing six years undergrad, well, that's fine, right? It's got that your strategy has to work for you and your family. That's the most important thing. Okay. Um, question, scholarships are only for first year or duration of the degree program? Yeah. So each school is different. Usually the merit scholarships, the ones that are not based on financial situation of you and your family, those depend on how you do. So often they are renewable. So for example, you might get it for the first year and they might say, okay, as long as you maintain a 3.0 average, you will be able to keep the scholarship for the next four years. So do check with the institutions, right? Because it can vary wildly from that to, oh, we only guarantee for the first year, right? So be very careful. Okay, um, where can I find merit scholarships and could you go over the definition of a merit scholarship? Yeah, so merit scholarships, the way when we work with students, we really want you to start with the merit scholarships offered by the colleges. There are a lot of third party uh, scholarships, right? And I'll talk about those in a minute. But the ones that are generally the largest, the largest amount is given directly by the college. Um, and the merit scholarships, it's not just academic merit, it can be talent, it can be leadership, it can be community service, right? Colleges are looking for different things. Some colleges define the merit scholarship parameters or criteria for getting them very narrowly. They say you have to have this test score and you have to have that GPA. And if you have that combination, you get this much money. And you, if you have, 
you know, slightly higher, you get slightly more money. I mean, there are colleges that have rubrics like that. And you can see that on the college website. But often they won't spell it out like that, right? So they're they're looking to create a really interesting, diverse um, freshman class and, and diverse in the sense of each person is bringing something new to the mix, right? So um, don't assume, look at what the definitions are for the colleges that you're interested in. Um, that is different than the financial aid. The financial aid is based on income and assets and that kind of thing. And there are two forms that you need to fill out for financial aid. One is the FAFSA, which opens on October 1st, better to do it as early as possible. The second one is the CSS profile. For most of the private colleges, they use CSS profile, which is on the College Board website, the same website as the SAT. There are private colleges that do not use CSS profile. They have their own thing that you have to fill out. So you'll, again, you'll have to check school by school, but it's best to fill those out early in the game. Now, once you've done all of that and you've submitted your applications and you've, you know, if they have, for example, extra essays for merit scholarships, um, if you've written those, you've submitted everything, then you have a chance to look at those third party scholarships. Two very good websites are Raise Me and Go Marry, M E R R Y, right? Um, they have a good reputation. And they, it's very hit and miss, you know, there, there, there are different strategies for the third party scholarships. Uh, sometimes students can do really well, and sometimes, you know, it's just kind of a waste of time. So um, we can certainly talk about that uh, at some point again, to go into more details, but hopefully you've gotten a sense of the, broad, the big picture of, of these two types of scholarships. Okay, so when testing is optional for admissions, is it better to submit test scores? Will you lose admission points if you don't? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, we attend a lot of sessions with admissions, uh, admission staff, and uh, a consensus seems to be that you're not going to get, you're not going to get penalized if you don't submit scores. Generally with our students, we recommend that you submit the scores if you are at the top or above the 50th percentile of scores from previously admitted students. If you are at the bottom or under the 50th percentile, we very rarely suggest that you submit those scores. If you're in the middle, then it's really going to depend on a couple of different factors, including what your GPA is. Um, you know, if your test score is right in the middle, but you have a lower GPA, it might be to your advantage to submit the test score, right? So you have to be very, very strategic. Um, and there are schools that are even test blind, right? That don't look at tests at all. Even if you sent it, they wouldn't look at it. Schools like the University of California system and Cal State, um, and there are more schools, right? More schools. A very few schools require test scores. Um, some, you know, schools in Florida, MIT, uh, Purdue, a couple of schools are requiring, you know, kind of went ba backwards from before, uh, uh, before COVID. But um, more and more schools seem to be stabilizing with test optional because they realize that uh, those test scores really measure how much test prep you've done. Uh, they're not measuring really college readiness and they are notoriously um, you know, biased those tests. So it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's trend. And um, I think it's important to understand what it means very clearly. Is the fee or a one-time payment or split into monthly payments? We can work out a payment plan if you guys decide to work with us. That's absolutely no problem. Okay. Um, all right. So 
In addition to counselor and teacher recommendations, do you recommend asking for a reference letter from a person outside of school who can describe your characteristics outside the classroom? I'm thinking of a nonprofit I'm heavily involved in. Yes, I think that's a great idea. Now, not all colleges will allow an additional letter of rec. Some won't even allow any letters of recommendation. But what we recommend to students is line these people up, get their agreement, say, you know, because out of all the schools you're applying to, some will welcome those kinds of letters. As long as the recommender knows you really well and is enthusiastic about you. You want those two things because why? Because the better they know you, the more examples they can give, right? You want those letters of recommendation to come alive so that the reader knows exactly, you know, has evidence from the recommender to prove that in fact, you do have the qualities that that recommender is talking about. So the more examples they can give, the better it is. And therefore, they have to really know you well. Now, uh, sometimes a, a faculty will, you know, say, oh, well, you know, if it's a big school, a teacher may say to you, here, fill out this form. Tell me about yourself. Because they're dealing with so many kids, right, that how in the world are they going to really get to know a student well? And, and that's okay. But then when you fill out the form, be very, very careful. Have an adult, a trusted adult, check your answers. You want those answers to be full of examples and full of information. And imagine that you're the one receiving that form and that you're going to write the letter of recommendation and ask yourself, do I have enough examples in here to back up my statements about this person? So that choice of who to ask is super, super important. Um, somebody outside of class can be very good. We've had students uh, get uh, letters of recommendation from work supervisors, uh, from coaches, from mentors. Um, you know, some schools even welcome peer recommendations, family recommendations. You know, we tend to kind of if it's possible to get somebody outside the family or outside the friend circle, it's probably better. There's some, there are a few colleges that require a peer recommendation. We had one last year. Um, so truly read what the instructions are, but it's a good idea to line these people up, line them up so that, and, and get their verbal agreement and then say, you know, when I fill in the common app, you're going to get a link please upload the letter. What you don't want is you don't want to read those letters because you need to sign away your right to read your letters of recommendation. So some teachers are unaware of this and they end up emailing the letter of recommendation to students. Try to not have that happen. Um, and if you get an email, try not to read it, right? Because you want to signal to colleges that uh, they they uh, can trust the honesty of those letters of recommendation because you haven't uh, read them. If you see if you see why they're doing that, it makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yes, have you read through, Michael, have you read through a lot of successful college admission essays? I certainly have. Um, and if so, what, what would you say are some common denominators between them? Yeah. So um, I think that there are a couple of things. One of them is authenticity. Um, one of them is authenticity and students who are writing about something that really matters to them and that they're passionate about, that comes through, right? What you couple of things to avoid. Don't, you know, don't try to guess what admission wants right? Sometimes it's not helpful to read all those quote unquote successful essays online. It's just not because, you know, either you read them and you think, oh my gosh, you know, how am I ever going to write a letter, uh, uh, an essay like that? Or you, you know, you read them and then you try to copy something. Um, you, you have a powerful story to tell. So the key is does that story serve the function that you want it 
to serve? Does that is that essay doing for you what you need it to do? What it needs to do is talk about what you're going to contribute. And sometimes it's not spelling it out, you know, I am compassionate, I am determined. It's not like that. It's in the story you tell, you know. We had a, a one some sometimes those essays are about really simple things, everyday things, but that are very touching. Um, we had one student who uh, basically didn't have time for extracurriculars because he was um, spending all his free time taking care of his sibling, single parent family. Uh, he cooked for the family. He cleaned the house. He picked up his sister at uh, school, took her to school in the morning. Basically, you know, he had a huge responsibility in that family. He uh, came to us with, um, you know, his his essay that he originally wrote uh, was why he wanted to be a lawyer. And, you know, I said to him, well, tell me about your everyday life. What do you, you know, what's important to you? How do you contribute to your community? What is your community? And he said, you know, my family. Anyway, he wrote this very touching um, essay, but it was about all the things he does at home and why he does them. And he was admitted to NYU, uh, exactly the program he wanted. Um, you know, and we had another student not too long ago who wrote an essay about how he had um, kind of betrayed his best friend uh, because uh, his friend had, um, um, his friend was no longer cool in high school. And so he wanted to be cool and he kind of, um, you know, shunned, shunned his, his best friend and had a series of events happen that made him realize that this was a really good friend and that, you know, being cool wasn't the most important thing. Anyway, the story was very, very simple, but it was very effective because it was authentic. Um, we've also had students who have a much more kind of intricate story to tell. We had um, a st Bulgarian student who wrote about uh, the Bulgarian language and why it is um, much more kind of um, a patriarchal. It, it doesn't it kind of in some ways support, um, you know, women's um, empowerment. Anyway, she had some very specific things to say. It was her opinion. And she gave supporting evidence and talked about her heritage. It was also a very powerful essay. We've seen really good essays on a wide variety of topics, uh, whether you're writing about gratitude um, or, you know, we've got a student um, writing about, um, you know, creating a lamp uh, in the, uh, you know, what makes you lose track of time. So it, it has to fit you. It has to fit you. Don't try to guess. Don't try to check off a box and be something that you're not. Um, the other thing to be careful about is don't have an adult write it. Don't have an adult squeeze all the, you know, personality and your personal voice out of it. <laughs> because uh, there's this kind of joke that, you know, says that you know, some colleges have a stamp that says DDI, dot, daddy did it, right? Don't do that. Um, you know, what we said about plagiarism is really true, but it's it's not just plagiarism. It's it's having other people do the work for you or squeeze all the personality and life out of it. Uh, your voice is super important. Um, and sometimes that's quite informal. Um, sometimes it's much more formal. People are different. So um, I hope that that has helped. OK, we're coming to the end of this. I see that we have quite a lot of questions um, and hopefully we have uh, shared some tips with you today. Uh, if you are interested in working with us, please look at the chat, please sign up for one of our um, free discovery sessions. And um, you, know, you have my contact information. If uh, you have a burning question, I am uh, definitely here and can, uh, can answer that. 
So I truly wish you joy in your learning, joy in your life. And um, I, I, I truly hope that we can connect again at some point and that I get to hear about your personal stories and your uh, talents and, you know, what your dreams are, what your aspirations are. I wish you all, 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 all the best. Thank you, everyone.